welcome to the D3 D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Right, everyone, welcome back to another D3 D4 Football Podcast. We are the podcast looking exclusively at Divisions 3 and Divisions 4 in old parlance, or League 1 and 2, as they are now called. Still don't quite understand why they changed the name to League 1 and 2, but there we go. Makes us feel better about ourselves, I suppose. Um, full t- full table of action, full slate of action in League 1 this weekend. Couldn't uh, Can't say the same for League 2, which had, I think, five games cancelled, one COVID-related, and four due to the weather. Although, looking at the pitches, I'm not sure how some of the games did survive, but there we go. We will, I'm sure, comment on those. I'm joined by Ed Walker and Chris Stringer, as always. Ed, good week? Yeah, pretty good week. I think we could say that. Yeah, much, much uh, improved after yesterday's result. That was uh, result of the day, no doubt, but good start. Good start for, well, good start for your new signings, that's what I'll say, because obviously uh, your management team already making a bit of an impact. Chris, you... uh, been watching the cricket, no football to distract you this weekend with Oldham's game being one of those called off. Yeah, I was slightly disappointed yesterday. I had a, a plan of a, a trio of sport, you know, have the cricket in the morning, the football in the afternoon, the rugby in the evening, and uh, Scunthorpe, you know, selfishly let their, let their pitch waterlog, so ruined my plans. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, I can't believe these teams can't control the weather above their own stadiums. I mean, it's, it's, it's outrageous. It's, it's just, just yeah. disgusting. Yeah, terrible. Absolutely ridiculous. But uh, I hope they get fined, frankly, for this. Um, <laughs> should be a rule. <laughs> anyway, before a big we... big bucket. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Come on, start... Why can't you just, like, get some hair dryers on it or something? Ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, put a temporary roof over them. Like, yeah, yeah. just doesn't... You've got the money to do that in the low leagues. There's plenty of money washing around, isn't there, to trying to do what were they, what do you call it marquees that's it stick a load of marquees <laughs> over these stadiums <laughs> dear me anyway before this descends into silliness before we've even got into the football let's jump in to league one league one and ed you'll be you'll be delighted to know that we're starting with burton this week because that is like i said the result of the weekend burton won hull city nil hull city prior to the second in the table uh really strong transfer window from the tigers they had some excellent like additions we've talked about them before. Burton needed a big window because you know in your position you really are only going one direction prior to to the new management team coming in. But they needed they needed I think I'm quickly made aware after their five one defeat to Oxford when they were having that sort of watching brief they knew straight away they needed something to change and and pretty quickly they went out and signed basically a load of really good players and. Uh, it wasn't surprising to us that Johnny Smith came on yesterday, got the winner. Great start. But the other signings that were introduced, Josh Earl, uh, Tom Hamer playing right back, uh, Sean Clare playing in cent- central midfield, and, and Josh Parker, a name uh, Julian fans will know from the Batman and Robin era where he was, uh, I think he was Robin to Tom Eves, his Batman. But uh, yeah, he, he turned up and played a blind Ed and um, huge result this. Huge result. Don't forget Ryan Broom as well, starting in midfield. Of course, yeah, right in the middle just, of the pack. Uh, that was one I was really happy with on deadline day. I was happy with the whole set, to be honest, because like you say, it was needed. Burton being a fair bit adrift of 23rd, never mind the bottom four altogether. They needed a window like this, and they've improved in areas that clearly need a lot of work. And I also love that they're bringing in players with a view to the future, getting Johnny Smith in permanently, bringing in Tom Hamer bringing in Terry Taylor, there's investment here. And you can see that they're clearly going to have a go at this survival push. And if they fall just short, they're in a position where they can build a decent-looking squad to maybe go at League Two next season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that that does seem, uh, you know, to be the way of it. I mean, what I would say as well is you've stopped conceding goals every single week. Yep. In You know, in Hatful, this is a second clean sheet in three games. It's against a great team as well. Um the, the big mission that they want to do is make you guys younger, and they've they've succeeded in that because they probably looked at it and thought, you know, what we need is energy, um, work rate. We need some guys with some real desire to 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 run in and win. And it's not like the players before didn't want to win, but when you've got how many players? Do you have? Is it seven players over the age of thirty three or something like that? 
There was a good number, but the starting lineup yesterday was probably the youngest I think we've had for years, to be honest. And it was good, a good mix of youth in there. But you still got people like John Braithwaite at the back and Lucas Aikens out the wing, who have been such long-serving and influential players on the club. So it's a, become a really nice blend of this younger players who can develop with the club alongside experienced heads to provide that know-how during games. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think it's it's a very good start. Obviously, they missed out on Ryan Bowman. Well publicised that there was a late bid for him. Exeter couldn't let him go, though, with John Akinde's move not materialising um, to Devon. So, yeah, it was uh, it was disappointing in that respect because I think he he maybe not his, he's not maybe pro- that prolific, but I mean he is this season doing quite well. But it's in terms of his hold up play and his ability to bring in some of those guys that you you signed in the midfield. I mean they're they're doing really well and it's a, it's great to see. You had I saw you tweeted out your new predictions for this season and I saw you having Burton stay up it's it's optimistic but it, it could happen it is optimistic and I know there are a few eyebrows raised from it but I just feel quite good I think if I'm honest if I look at the teams in the bottom four currently possibly even just a bit out of the bottom four the best spirits around the fan base and the camp I'd have to say is a Burton Albion at the moment they've got a lot of confidence back into them there's a hugely loved figure back in charge of them and Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank He's got a fantastic coach working alongside him as an assistant to Dino Mamria. They've had probably the best transfer window I can remember, especially January-wise, for as long as I've supported this club. Been a really, really productive window with an eye to the future as well as short term. And I don't really see what can't go wrong. This is That result yesterday is very much like it was in the first spell under Hasselbank, where it was a solid defensive display that really limited the amount of chances the opposition could get. And then hit them with an opportunity with a last with a late winner that makes it really difficult for them to come back. There were loads of this kind of result in the first spell, so that's why people are so happy about it. Yeah, great result. Hull, uh, yeah, very strong team. Um, they did have an effort hit the crossbar from from Doherty, but you know you can't complain too much in in the end because I think uh, Burton deserved no shot on target, no yeah. shot on target on a team like that. That's fantastic. Yeah, great effort, great effort from from all concerned, and it was a uh, it was one of those performances you had to be at your best, and you certainly were. So. Hope springs eternal in that part of the world. Burton won Hull nil final score from the Pirelli yesterday. Uh, another huge game at the bottom of the table was Wigan versus Wimbledon. It finished Wigan 2, Wimbledon 3. Uh, Joe Piggott was again key, scored 15 goals this season for the Dons. And interesting move made by uh, by the new interim head coach was to, to strip him of the captaincy so that he could concentrate on his performances and I thought this was you know this can work two ways can't it because it could leave the player feeling oh what have I done to deserve that or it liberates them and I think the thinking behind this was it would liberate him and it certainly did and and Chris AFC Wimbledon with a massive result it's the it's nice to see them move away from a system that perhaps hasn't been working with the three at the back they went to a 4-2-3-1 and their exuberance and their youth and their uh, players just just bound full of energy. They've got some really good runners in that uh, in that sort of three behind the attacker. They they came through with a massive result. Yeah, it was a fantastic performance yesterday. As you, you know, you point out uh, Pigger. I think uh, 19 Gale at the back had a had a really impressive performance. And Mark Robinson's really sort of you know stamping his mark on the team. He's a, as you say he's, he's mixed up the captaincy. Um, He's been challenging some of the the structures at the club as well. Um, it sounds to me like he's he's making a little bit of a push for the job, um, perhaps on a more permanent basis. Well, he did mention in his post match interview. I mean, he he was you know saying if I'm given this opportunity, you know, I, I, he's very he can't, he's quite calm. He, he's quite and he's he's he was right in his comments saying that this is only three points. It doesn't mean anything. We, we you know, uh, it's it's all about our performance levels and how we can continue to improve. Because because if we lose next weekend, this is all been undone very quickly so he's, he's he's right in that but it was a huge game in the context of both teams and their position in the league table and I th- I thought they were excellent um, credit to, to Wigan as well I like the fact that they have changed up their team a bit in considering the financial constraints and the issues they've got they're, they're not a bad team I think Will Keane and, and Jamie Proxy who got on the score sheet did well Curtis Tilt's an excellent signing um Scott Wooten playing centre-back partner with him, not universally accepted as a great defender by Plymouth fans, um, especially after a few shaky performances this season. But, you know, they've got Callum Lang in there, Chris, who you know well, and it's good to see him back in the EFL. I think he, 
he should be in the EFL play. He's a, he's a really talented young... Well, he's not so... How old is he now? 23, maybe? Yeah, 23 years. Same age as me. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he's back in there. So they do have some good players, but you know the, the season that they've had, it's a huge uphill struggle. Um, I know The Athletic put out an article, didn't they, that Darren Gibson and a consortium were looking to buy the club. Have you guys heard any more on that? I don't... I haven't seen anything else. I've not heard much more on that. I've no, not heard I've, much. I very much hope a takeover comes, though, because Wigan fans deserve better than what they're having this season. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah. Not being there to see it is is all, always difficult because we all love being in the stadiums, but when your team is is in such flux, I mean, it's it's difficult. It really is difficult. Uh, at that, Another game at the bottom... Um, not so much at the bottom for for Shrewsbury, Ed Shrewsbury. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, they beat Swindon by a goal to nil, um, and yet again they they keep going. This this team that Sam Ricketts built, even if he does say so himself, is absolutely superb, Chris, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, really impressive performance yesterday. Um, still lots of concerns over Swindon. Um, but that's to take nothing away from Shrewsbury. We were fantastic yesterday. Yeah, they were good. They were good. I, I joke, I jest about Rick. I mean, Ricketts did come out in this interview and he's always going to try and say how he built this foundation for this team. And, you know, <laughs> but one of the comments which made me cringe was he said, the fans not being in the stadium impacted their view on the performances. He said, in those early games when we were creating 18, 19 chances per game, you know, it doesn't show properly on I follow. <laughs> <laughs> if they were in what? the stadium they would have seen how many chances we were creating and what great performances they were and I thought supports aren't stupid are they they watch football on TV do they know how cameras work I don't know yeah it's exactly what What do they do put an eye patch over the lens every time Shrewsbury <laughs> go forward utter, you know, utter, utterly ridiculous uh, comments and actually let's 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 debunk the myth that they were creating 18-19 chances per game because in the 13 games that he had in charge, they created an average of 3.8 chances per 90 minutes. So 3.8? Yeah, 3.8. And, and granted, actually, to be fair, since uh, Steve Cottrell's come in, they've increased that to an average of 4.1. So it's not gone up a lot. But what I would say, and I didn't have time to check this out before the game, I'd be interested to know what the XG of those chances are. Because I would imagine that the way they're playing... Uh, they probably have created better quality chances, um, even though the increase of the actual amount of them has, has only gone up incrementally. But remember, that's you know he's been in charge less games. He hasn't, you know, Steve Cottrell's not actually been there for a while. And uh, again, you know, let's hope he gets uh, fully recovered soon from this. But no, utterly ridiculous from Sam Ricketts to suggest that the, the fact that as soon as he's left, they've get they've got better is all down to the the fact that he was such a good manager. Um, really. Really poor. Uh, however, you know they did get a, another clean sheet. They did get a win on the road. They did uh, get a wonderful goal from Harry Chapman, who is is looking smart. I said in um, our sort of look at the transfer window that Curtis Main would be the kind of player who wouldn't necessarily score you a hat full of goals, but my opinion on him is that he would bring others into play because he's got a very strong hold up play, and he did that well. Got an assist on this one, um, and yeah, just. Thoroughly... Really smart player, Curtis May. Really, really smart player. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. And I thought this was a nice pickup. I know that they were trying to get Will Grigg, and that uh, you know it was it was all done and done and sealed until last minute. Uh, MK Nods came in and, and signed him, and that's it's, it's not for me to comment whether that's right or wrong. I think uh, it's football, and it happens all the time, unfortunately. He's got a link with MK Dons, hasn't he? He does. He does, and I think um, that can sometimes be a big factor. That can sometimes be a big factor, and I, you know, but I think let's not uh, let's not worry too much because, like, say Curtis Main comes in and um, he brings others into play well, and he set up the goal well. Swindon are just playing badly, <laughs> um, and the stuff off the pitch is, you know, is pretty terrible as well. Not sure who actually owns it. Going to court soon to sort of have. Yeah, so about that because the, the the owners not the, the fans have called for more transparency, so the owners decided not to. File the books or something. As yeah. a, uh, if I've if, if I've understood understood correctly from um, um, Price of Football, I think put something out the other day. Yeah, I I'm not quite sure to be honest exactly what's going on. All I know is that there there is a dispute over who actually owns the club. 
That's um, impressive. Yeah, I don't know how you get to that stage. Due to, <laughs> and was it due to something like third party investment or third party? Oh, I don't know. Oh dear. Yeah, oh it's dear. all very messy. But what is sad is the, the performances on the pitch under John Sheridan are, are not good. And they're not no. getting results. He's, um, he's a funny one, John Sheridan. I think I think I was saying to you last night, he's, he's very hit and miss. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously he's had a good track record with Oldham, particularly in in relegation scraps. But you look at some of the other clubs he's been to, and, and it's not always worked out for him. It's quite funny that you'd bypass a midfield that's got Matty Palmer, Josh Lydon, and uh, and Jackie Payne in there. <laughs> you know, if that's the style you want to play. Um, well, he got he got he got so much out of Palmer when he um, when they were together at Oldham, uh, and I just expect a little bit more from him at the moment. Yeah, sorry, Jordan Lydon, not Josh Lydon. Jordan Lydon. And, and obviously yeah. he, he was a class player for Oldham in that stint. You know he's had his injury problems. But, you know, if you've got midfielders who are good ball carriers and good ball players, then you've just got to use them, honestly. It's, uh, uh, a a miss or lose a cracking play to have in a, in a relegation scrap. But it's interesting to see how he does. I, I, I don't rate him badly, miss Lou, actually. Um, he was probably one... I, I think he was the best of that group that came in at Oldham. But you think in the in terms of... You know, if you're comparing him to like Bronjo, Maouche, and Silla, he was the better player out of all of them. I think he was best suited to to English football, definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Fleetwood and Bristol Rovers drew nil nil, as did Accrington and Northampton. Sunderland travelled to MK Dons and got a two all draw. Uh, one thing I found to my detriment about Sunderland is that they, in fact, have a team full of right backs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I. I I didn't rate their transfer winner that highly, um, and I still stand by. I mean, you know, they were saying it's their best window in ages. They were superb. They've signed all, you know, these these four four signings or five signings they made. They're all good, and um, they address key areas of the pitch and, and stuff like that. Fine, but I would look at that that group of signings they made and say, well, name one of them who's tried and tested at League One level and it's going to definitely improve the team. I, I'd be yeah, I'd, be, I'd probably agree with you on that, James. Um, I don't think any of the, any of the players that they've signed are bad signings whatsoever. I think I think actually all of them are, are pretty good League One signings. Um, they're all untried, though. But, but they're all untried, you, yeah. And and, I'm, and actually, I'm, I'm not sure they they particularly fill the gaps. And again, I, I you know I've seen Sunderland fans mentioning you know that they've got a lot of right backs, but again, I'd, I'd echo your comments on this. They don't actually have a a lot of right backs that are effective. Well, they don't know. I mean, they're playing oh, Max Power right. right back yesterday. Oh, well, yeah, all real right backs. Max Power is Max not Power right back when you had Luca nine in midfield. Yeah, which I thought was a bit weird. But yeah. why would they choose? Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. They had Dion Sanderson on the bench as well, who is a better right back than Max Power. <laughs> Where's Colin um, McCoughton at the minute? I don't. I think he's injured actually. Oh, okay. He's okay. Uh, he's but again, like, he's not played think. brilliantly, has he? Um, but they drew two all, and uh, Aidan McGeady's there, sort of their key player in terms of you know a couple of assists yesterday, drove them on well. It was an enjoyable game, according to all the people that I've uh, I've sort of spoke to on Twitter. They enjoyed the match, thought it was pretty exciting. Sunderland good going forward, looked a bit shaky at the back, and I think that's that's the thing. You know, the goals they conceded weren't great. Luke O'Nine easily brushed aside for the. Uh, I think it was the second goal where it comes off Cameron Jerome. That's great play from Matt O'Reilly, though, to be fair to him. He's had a good impact at MK Dons. Um, and, you know, the pitch wasn't great. I think um, they've done well to to get the game uh, playable because it, it was better, according to uh, some of the people who were watching it on... I think it was on... They played on Tuesday, didn't they? In the... In the stuff one? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, yeah. the pitch was worse then, apparently. So, uh, interesting to see that they've made it uh, better. A lot of games really suffering from terrible pitches. <laughs> terrible, terrible pitches this weekend. Uh, but Sunderland getting a two or draw. Uh, Lee Johnson trying to change the way they're playing into attacking football. Like I say, my my point about Sunderland is they're a team that I think if they had a couple of dynamic fullbacks, because Chris, you were saying to me yesterday, Johnson's going to play this style, isn't he? Where the fullbacks are very, very, very important. Yeah, um, he, he, he likes to, to get the fullbacks involved on rushing a little bit. Um, and at the moment, I don't think Sunderland have quite got the players for that. No, well, exactly, and and 
I always use this example. If you want to play where your fullbacks are key, you're going to need excellent fullbacks to do it. And Luton did it. And their fullbacks, of course, were Jack Stacey and James Justin, who went to play in the Premier League. That's how good they were. And that's the standard, I think, that you're going to need if you want to play that kind of attacking football using your fullbacks to overlap. I thought, um, is it Jordan Jones that they signed from, on loan from Rangers? He, is it Jordan Jones? Uh, he came yes. off the bench yeah. and was quite good, apparently. Uh, looked quite looked quite useful. And uh, what, I, what I would say is he, signing these guys who are promising is, is great. I like Lyndon Gooch being in the team, by the way. I just I think he's such a good player. Um, hasn't played as much football perhaps this season as you'd expect, but he's a very good player. Um, and after a poor first half, they did come out much better in the second half and get the result. But again, you can't deny that um, MK Dons are a good footballing side. They they dominate the ball, and they have players like Cameron Jerome. Ed, you'd have you know his links with Russell Martin, but he has had a very big impact on this team. He's been phenomenal, hasn't he? I think mm-hmm. we um I remember seeing him come back from I believe he was in Turkey just before he come back to Uncle Don's and we we're kinda of curious about the signing. Maybe he could be a man to provide the goals. He really has been one to provide the goals because he still looks quite dynamic, I think. I think he's still got good athleticism, really does well. I think he followed in on a shot to score yesterday. Got himself in amongst the goals. I think he's on eight now for the season. He's been a really important signing, much like part of their midfield has as well. Yeah, yeah, great, great to see him doing well, and obviously that's that's a signing that Russell Martin will have brought in because he he understands what kind of player he is and he knows he's going to give him uh, give his all, give everything, and lift that team. So uh, yeah, great result. Uh, Plymouth and Portsmouth, uh, they call it the Dockyard Derby, a two-all draw. It was thrown away this by Argyle. I mean, honestly, you're two 0 up, and then Kellen Watts makes that terrible mistake where you try and usher the ball out. That's clearly got no pace on it to do that and uh, Ronan Curtis does well to nick it off him and then finish well Portsmouth taking that uh, they take that all day long after the position they were in in the game but Plymouth have been on a nice run it they, they've started to uh, motor up the table I think it's six unbeaten now Ryan Lowe signing a new long-term contract which is which is great considering that he's always linked to every single job in the EFL <laughs> um, he's linked to every job in the EFL by Gabe Sutton is what he is <laughs> he loves he loves recommending him to clubs. Loves yeah. recommending him. Yeah, I mean he's a great manager, but I think if you're Ryan Lowe and you're at a club that's going in the right direction and yeah, let's be honest, Argyle are one of those teams who have got such a lot of potential. They have a huge fan base, catchment area is brilliant, and you know, I think they're well run. So this is a team that if he stays at and continues to do the work he's doing, then yeah, he's got a great opportunity to take a team forward and I think sometimes it's easy to look at opportunities elsewhere and, and go and it didn't work out for Paul Hurst when he was at Shrewsbury um, and I'd say that's a that's a can be a bit of a warning if you go somewhere else that seems like it's a bigger job but you don't have the stability then it cannot work out for you but yeah another another important result for them they've drawn with Accrington and Portsmouth who have played very well recently in their last two games and obviously beat Swindon and Sunderland away so Looking good for Argyle. Portsmouth, uh, just, they'll take that all day long, as I said. It's yeah. it's not a game where they check take... Check it out, whispers, whispers have started again. Yeah, <laughs> check it out, God, yeah. After, yeah, where are they in the table, Portsmouth? Let's, uh, let's have to double check, because they're still... They're, yeah, fifth. Fifth, yeah. Oh, they are, are a huge three points off the automatics as well, so... With a game in hand on hold. Yeah, Jack, it's not doing a good job at all, is he? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they need someone who's some experience who's been there and done it because Jackets never got a team promoted from League One before either <clears throat> right so Charlton beat Rochdale 2-0 good performance this from Charlton uh, going to a place like Rochdale who didn't score which is surprising for them because they they just have been in great scoring form um, but I thought Charlton had a very strong transfer window guys I thought uh, Jane Stockley uh, was a nice addition big presence up front perhaps what they needed I think this Liam Miller uh, has been excellent since arriving. Uh, nice to see Deshi Oshalaja get a goal. First goal he scored for Charlton, about 40 games. And uh, yeah, Charlton needed like a, they needed a good performance defensively. Needed a game where they didn't make defensive errors and mistakes and 
to get this season going because they also signed Ed um, Jayasimi, who is a great player. Yeah, I really like that one. I remember, um, I don't know if he was quite recreating what he wanted to do last season, this season with Swindon, but I think that's a fantastic addition to them. I know they went through quite a lot of wingers trying to find one. I think they went to Randall, went to Charlie Kirk. I think there was another one in there. And then they eventually settled on Jai Simi, who I think is a very good player, one that could prove very good for them. Yeah, I think he will be. And I think uh, I think they look for a certain... It's clear from their recruitment they look for a certain type of player, don't they, Charlton? They like playing football and they would look for skillful, dynamic players. I like the fact that they brought in Schwartz. I think um, with Anike Schwartz, Stockley, you know, they've got a really potent-looking attack. Uh, Anike's been in really good form as well and I don't think he gets mentioned a lot but um, he's one of these players who is extremely impressive Darren Prattley again an understated player with huge experience in their midfield and uh, and Foster Kasky who is is a very good player as well so Charlton have built a nice team I think this transfer window has been good for them and it's given them far better depth and options so keep an eye on them for for the rest of the campaign because I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they they get on. I do like Lee Bowie. I know he's recently thrown some toys out of the pram and caused a bit of a stir in that respect. But um, no, he's, he's he's a very good manager. Uh, Peter Brough, we talked about bad pitches. They beat Crew 2 0 on possibly the worst pitch of the afternoon for any game that went ahead. It it was terrible. I I, I could see some grass on there to be fair, but it was sporadically you, patched you, out. Are you sure that wasn't just moss? Moss. Cress, I think it might have been. <laughs> Cress. It, it wasn't. It wasn't a good pitch at all. Um, but they they played it to their advantage and uh, two 0 win for Posh. They've again. They're another team um, who we. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say they want to keep an eye on because they they've been up there all season. But um, at, at home they're very strong. They need to be, I think, because some of their results on the road have been hit and miss. I think the, the result they had at, at Shrewsbury last time out was. Um, Disappointing, but they've beaten Crew and, and they'll take they'll take that one because you know I looked at the last three home games or four home games or whatever it was and and it's it's been a, a decent run for them. Obviously the nil nil Bristol Rovers was quite disappointing, but they beat Charlton there, they beat MK Dons three nil there, they beat Rochdale four one there. So um, and they beat Argyle going back into November. So they they've had a really good run of home form, which is kind of keeping them going despite throwing away points on the road at a uh, place like FC Wimbledon, Shrewsbury and, and Portsmouth. So uh, a big result for them again. I don't I don't know what you guys think of, of Crew now. Um, they really didn't have a bad transfer window, did they? Ed? You know, in terms of they, they lost Perry and G, but they get a Pickering back on loan. They've still kept Ryan Wintle, Charlie Kirk. Do, do, do you still see them as being this side that is going to have enough in that in that tank to hit the plus because like we said they don't beat the big teams do they? they don't beat the teams in that top section and they you know yesterday's result is um, another example of that I kind of think they're going to be one who will sort of float around the edge of those playoff places I don't know necessarily if I fancy them to get into it just because of like you say that struggle to really cope with the top top teams there's nothing wrong with that by the way you've got to remember they were in League 2 last season they were a wonderful side and I think where they are now would be a fantastic finish to them regardless. I'm a little bit worried with slowly seeing the beginning of the end for this squad. I'm slowly worried about losing Perry and G. Yes, they got Pickering back on loan, but Pickering will go to Blackburn at the end of the season. You worry about what's going to happen to people like Wintel and Kirk, and it's it's something we sadly see with crew often, that they bring a squad of lovely quality players together, and they just don't last very long. And It's really sad to see from a crew perspective. It's uh, it's the inevitable cycle of lower league football life, isn't it? Oxford had this yeah. several times. In fact, every summer we sort of see our better players leave, um, and we just have to try and rebuild. But I think the good thing about Crew is their academy will keep on producing. Luke Offords, the latest guy really to come through, but they've got a couple of others who look quite good. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, you know, if if the ambition is to get into the championship, then you know you want to keep hold of these guys. But let's be honest and realistic. Every team wants to get to the championship, be in and amongst those teams that do so. But it's very very hard to do unless you're spending big money or have a bigger budget. And if you have to sell your best players, you know it it can it can push you back. And Oxford, a prime example of this. You know we we've each year had to keep competing, but selling our best players, and um, it, you know it's very difficult to stay amongst the top teams. So, interesting, interesting comments. I don't, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think but we'll have to see with that, certainly. I, I'd love for this squad to not be taken apart as it has been in previous years, but you're always quite conscious about if they keep impressing the way they are, and there's no doubt how impressive they are, there's bound to be suitors in the summer. I've got, I think, well, you mentioned Charlton were going for, for Kirk already. I mean, wouldn't surprise me to see them back for him, yeah. um, depending on how this season finishes, but someone will come in for him. You're almost, almost certain. A bit sad to see, but rather inevitable. Definitely. Uh, Ipswich beat Blackpool 2-0. Uh, Ipswich don't have, you know, they have not had a lot to cheer about. I asked a few fans how Luke Matheson looked because I thought that was a really nice signing because he is the kind of dynamic fullback that they need. Um, and he played solid but not great. I mean, that didn't have to. Uh, again, like we said, Blackpool's, uh, Blackpool's ability to, to sort of really push on hasn't yet transpired. Um, you know, I do like I do like this team. I do like Blackpool's team in places. I think uh, Kenny Dougal's a, a class player. Embleton's an interesting pickup from Sunderland. Um, I, if he gets enough game time, that that'd be a good move for both teams, I think. Um, but again, you know, they go there, they don't score, they don't create a lot, they don't put enough. I don't think Ipswich felt they were ever under pressure. This felt like a very comfortable victory for a side who've been woefully out of form. So it tells you a little bit about how Blackpool are just falling short. I do like the the additions that Ipswich make. I mean, you know, they didn't make many, but they were in the right places. So Luke Matheson coming in, uh, Parrot coming in up front, again, a bit untested from Spurs. Be interested to see how he does. But Luke Thomas is a good player. Um, And they've got enough talent in the team already to to suggest to me that they should be doing a lot better. And this is all on Lambert for me, as you know. Uh, No excuses from him about, you know, it's it's the fans creating negativity. He now has to drive this team forward. He's got a squad good enough to push on into those playoff places. He should be doing better, to be frank. You know, if you look at that squad on paper, uh, I don't know if you agree on this, Ed, but I think that they should be at least in the playoffs, minimum. No, I completely agree with you. The problem is, I don't particularly trust Ipswich under this manager and under this owner. And I think that's going to be the thing that stops them out getting in the top six this season. Not the players. The players, I really like the look of the squad. Particularly like that Troy Parrott signing. I think he's someone who could prove really good. But I feel they're still restricted by who's overseeing them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look at their three in midfield as well. You've got Andre Duzel, who I'm old enough to have remembered his dad playing. And his dad was an excellent player. They've got Judge, who we know. And Flynn Downs, who's just like dynamic and as as probably one of the best midfielders at this level. So they've got a great midfield in in as much they remind me of Hull in that respect. It's just can they can they get enough goals? Um, you know, nice goal from Alan Judge by the way yesterday. What a finish that was. To hit that from that distance into the corner with that pace I thought was a lovely goal. Um and to keep the clean sheets important. But like I say, yeah, not sure of Lamb, but I'm not gonna let them off the hook easily. Um a, a good result yesterday, but um needs more. Oxford and Doncaster played out a cracker. Um, people probably thought I'd lead with this one, but they played out an absolute cracking. A 3-2 win. Doncaster, poor first half from Doncaster. Rather understated, didn't really get going. Oxford dominated the ball, had a lot of possession. Uh, but Doncaster are absolutely clinical. I think that's the one word I'd use to describe in this season because only six teams in the division have created less chances than them. They're, they're, they're not a team that creates huge amounts of chances. Um, but... They take them, and they take them with skill, panache. I mean, Taylor Richards, that that third goal of the game where he nutmegs someone and then finishes across the keeper into the bottom corner, that was absolutely superb. I get the feeling we're going to be seeing him playing for Brighton next season. Is he? Where's he on loan from? He's on loan from Brighton and Hove Albion. Yeah, so it makes and sense. And I, I, I sense. really get the feeling they're going to give him a go at Brighton next season. He's looked absolutely incredible. He is. He, he was... That goal just summed his, his game up. And actually, the, the way Doncaster press was was very impressive. Um, I mean, I give Oxford credit, though, because I did say last week that I didn't see us getting a result here. And we actually did a lot better than I thought. Like I say, we dominated the first half. We put them under a fair bit of pressure. Um, and it was, a, you know, for a neutral watching that, um, it would have been a really enjoyable game. And I think Doncaster and Oxford have been in form. And you could see that these were two quality sides playing good football and it was fairly you know it's fairly end to end we had a couple of chances we, we probably felt we could have got a point and I think if you look at the game as 90 minutes we deserved a draw certainly uh, I won't 
be crying about a 3-2 defeat against a team like Doncaster, though, who have been absolutely superb. Okanabiri with a great finish. Um, and they came out that second half, Doncaster, and they were absolutely electric. And that's Darren Moore. That goes to Darren Moore. That ability to look at a situation where his team was struggling and immediately change it without really... You know, he didn't come in and make loads of changes at half-time or anything like that. He just... It's just what he expressed to them at, at the break, change how they played. And it worked. Straight away worked. And obviously, once they get that two-goal lead, it's always going to be difficult for Oxford to get back in the game. And uh, so it proved. But Shadipo came on and, and scored. He's been impressive this season for us. I thought Barker had a nice debut, as did Elliot Lee, playing either side of Matty Taylor up front. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a defeat. Um, but seven wins in a row prior to this is, uh, yeah, very enjoyable. Did you guys watch the Lincoln Gillingham game? Yes. What did you make of it, Ed? Because I thought Lincoln just were well, that was a typical Appleton away performance against a, a Gillingham side that are very physical and they're very good at what they do. I think I said it full time. They're just so fun. I, I just love watching this team at the minute. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. Jorge Grant, as we're going to have to call him from now on, to make him sound more flareful and authentic or George A. Grant in oh, midfield. Hey. Absolutely terrific. Lovely back heel in the built in the first goal. Jorge. 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 Jorge can, we just, Grant. can we just spend a minute on that? <laughs> Jorge Grant. Give him more flair, you know. Alright, George A. Grant then we'll stick with George, that. George. George. Yeah. George A. Grant. Terrific. And I think I think I said it full time. You get teams that come up from League One to the Championship and you look at the squads and you feel you need quite a lot of work to handle the step up because the step up from League One to Championship is big. We know that. I'd argue it's the biggest in the whole English pyramid. I look at that Lincoln squad and I think, apart from the loans that you maybe might need to replace, I don't think you need that much work because what Appleton's built is this young, fluid side that's only going to get better with time. It's one that can potentially improve with the club as they climb up the pyramid and it's such a wonderful side. Love the goal from McGrandles as well. Tom Hopper getting on the end of the third chance as well. They look so good, and I'd love to see them in promotion at the end of the season, potentially. Yeah, it'd be amazing. It would be amazing. And they had a good transfer window as well, didn't they? Because, again, they were just... Cohen Bramwell coming in um, It's a very Appleton signing. Regan Paul joining, again, another another option off the bench, another bit of depth. Yeah, I thought they did really well. I thought they did really well in the transfer window. I thought they added where they needed to. Um was it a penalty? Uh, I'm trying to remember the incident now. It, it, it was a, an elaborate fall, if it was not a dive, to say the least, from Brennan Johnson. Mm, he's yeah. he's done that a few times this season. Um, stuck his leg into someone or something like that. And Again, I don't think it matters in the overall, because I think Lincoln looked the more likely to win it. Um, however... It, it was a key moment in the match, so you could always argue that, couldn't you? And I thought they were slightly fortunate <laughs> to get the penalty. Um, but good, I mean, it, the 3-0, I will be honest, does flatter them in terms of the entire game performance. I thought Gillingham were better than the 3-0 suggests, and I thought players like Dempsey looked good, Graham looked very good, uh, Oliver had a difficult afternoon, I think the referee was, was pretty hard on him at times. Um, but yeah, Lincoln... Went there, get a clean sheet, and get another big, big result. So there's not a lot to to complain about. Michael Appleton will be absolutely delighted. And, you know, importantly, they are now top of the table again. 51 points from 25 games. Hull a second. Level on points with Doncaster. Both got 48. Uh, But Doncaster have three games in hand on Hull, uh, which is huge at this stage of the season. Peterborough and Portsmouth and Charl to make up the top six. Sunderland... Uh, on the outside looking in this week after only getting a draw at Stadium MK. Accrington still got some games in hand and on 41 points, so they're right on the cusp of those playoffs. Um, and at the bottom, Ed Burton, 19 points now. So the gap is still there, but it's only five points now, and you've, like you say, looking already like you're a better team. So it's uh, it's doable. Wigan, Northampton, Swindon make up the other bottom four with Bristol Rovers and AFC Wimbledon. On the outside, uh, as it stands, Shrewsbury moving away. 30 points now, Shrewsbury. Um, 
and that's just superb from where they were to get up to where they are now is, is such a great turnaround uh, anyway let's jump in to a rather truncated League 2 League 2 and Bradford Exeter is the best place to start because this was an interesting game in as much as Bradford had quite a lot of transfers uh, that went through I think they had a great window but they had a few players injured as well like Danny Rowe was missing for this one so they went with Charles Vernon up front he scored Ed on his debut he did score on his debut, what they call, I think they called it a real poacher's finish from him. Mm. I still don't entirely get that signing. Not so much for Brad to doing him in, he's a quality player. I don't really understand why Burton let him go. The you, only thing you got really, a fee for him, I think, was one the of the The only thing factors. I can really think of from that perspective is that Hasselbank and Mamre weren't too impressed with his defensive output because he's not really a kind of player you want to see tracking back. You want him to be the man going forward, leading on the counter and on the attack. So... I hope they don't regret letting him go, but I think from a Bradford perspective, it's an absolutely wonderful signing and they're going to absolutely love having him around. I do wonder how much the fee paid a part in that as well. Potentially, yeah. You paid a fee for Hamer, a small one, but a fee nonetheless. Um, I imagine there'll be a a signing on bonus for Johnny Smith. Yeah, I don't think there'll be a I mean, I think the important, I think the thing is that they wanted to bring in players they wanted money perhaps and they they could see you know if we could recoup some of these costs i mean this is covid yeah. times as well so um but bradford wanted him bradford get him bradford have you know again got everyone yeah they, to, <laughs> they did well though i think they had to do something because they were yeah. yeah come on let's be honest under mccall they were woeful and like i said last week it's not necessarily down to the new signings that have seen their form change because they haven't been involved hugely uh, but it gives them options now, and that's important because they had some injuries earlier in the season, which left them with just Clayton Donaldson up front. And you know, he's for all his efforts and what an affable chap he is, he's not got the same. He's not got the legs to do it anymore. He's not as effective um, as someone you you want to play up top on on his own. So, but Exeter. You, so I was, I was going to say, what, what you feel with these signings is that they've got a couple of months now in, into to well, it, it probably secures pretty comfortably Bradford's lead two position and it also gives yeah. them a few months to gel together before next season where yeah. you some, know, some of us sitting here talking on this podcast think they might make the playoffs Ed why remember. not why not you if, there's a, if there's a season to do it it's this one come on you look at what Mansfield are doing or Tranmere have been doing you go on a winning run you can go to the bottom to the top I don't see why Bradford can't do that I think there's a lovely side they were missing some key players yesterday people like Danny Rowe I think that's a quality side there. And if they get it right, I don't see why they could never go. Do you think there's going to be... A, my only thing with them is, is they're going to be a team in that top group that drops enough points for them to make it up? Because at the moment, on the outside of those players looking in, you have uh, Cheltenham and, and Salford, who I think, despite issues um, recently, you they're both strong squads, and so they might get in there. I mean, maybe Morecambe? Who lost Adam Phillips? I do look at Morecambe. I also kind I'm still not entirely sure about Newport. I'm worried about them, particularly with the case of just having to replace Scott Twine. I think for me, he was the best player in League Two at the first half of the season, and replacing him is going to be difficult. I feel like Josh Sheen could be someone who takes up the positions that he was in, but they need to keep 11 players on the pitch, really, to have a chance in every game. That's the big problem. I'm sure we'll get onto that with Newport, but they're... Their discipline record has been woeful. I mean, I'm worried about them falling away. I'm worried about Morecambe potentially falling away. I'm still not entirely sure about Exeter. I think there's some defensive vulnerability still with them there that could cost them in the long term. But I still think one of those in that pack around the middle of the table could potentially push themselves up into that spot. It's such a tight table at the moment. Go on, Oldham. <laughs> yeah, Chris, but, you know, just getting the top half first, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we're, there. we're so close we're so close so close what are you 13th with one point 13th. I, I would laugh if that's how you finished 13th don't do it to me James. Out, outside the top half of the table on goal difference don't do it to me oh dear uh, no but it was an impressive second half performance from Exeter I, I, I have to say the character in that squad has, has been good and oh, did anyone see Rory McArdle's injury? Like, not actually see it. I didn't see it. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't see it. But he basically had a injury to his private parts that needed ten stitches. Oh, yes. Dear. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That was mid. That was midweek, wasn't it? I was watching that game, and he was. 
down for quite a while. Yeah. Did you oh. see after the after the he slid in to block a shot and the guy sort of stood on him afterwards. He got yeah. straight up. I'm not joking. He got straight up and ran up up the pitch, and he has a tentative look into his shorts, and you just see him like go, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah. I have to say, he, he actually walked off the pitch. To be fair to him, but my goodness me, just shudders, shudders down my spine when I I had that one. I was like, oh my goodness, every man's worst nightmare. Um, oh. So he'll be out for a little while, I think, recovering from that one. Uh, Cambridge they beat Barrow two nil uh, again on an awful pitch, but this is another impressive result because, like I said, they're they're going great guns. Uh, they're strikers who have been such a good partnership this season, scored 30 goals between them. Uh, they combined again in this one to see off Barrow, who are still, I think, a work in progress under Michael Jolly. And I think they need to work quickly because they're, they're one of these sides that could get drawn into it. But uh, Chris Cambridge are yeah, doing, doing great, going great guns. And Wes Houlihan, another assist. <laughs> what a player. Um, I think they were, they were linked with him at the start of last season as well, weren't they? And Am I right in saying they signed him this the summer just gone? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I remember saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure he's got it. Um, you know, I think he's maybe a little bit past it now. Uh, a year, a year later on from that, and he's absolutely storming League Two. Um, yeah, it's fantastic to see. Yeah, I don't think really there well. was there ever any doubts about his quality. Really, it was his thickness, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, I don't think, I don't think anyone ever looked at Wes Hulan and thought, yeah, you're not good enough for this league. No, no, not no, a chance. Definitely not. Not a chance. Yeah. But they've managed his fitness superbly well. They have, yeah. Yeah. You know, the temptation would be let's play him every single game for ninety minutes. But they've they've basically just taken him out of the side for some of these midweek games and uh and it's it's got the best out of him. And they sit at the moment three points clear at the top of the table, Cambridge, looking really, really strong. So uh, Crawley crapuscular yesterday. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I'm allergic to your bad puns, sorry. Yeah, it was an awful, <laughs> awful, awful first half performance. And John Yems, after being charged for trying to get into the referee's dressing room after their one, uh, their nil-nil draw with Leighton Orient. I, has anyone seen his interview? I didn't catch up with it, but... <laughs> I didn't watch it. I wonder if he let Lee Bradbury do it. I don't uh, know. He's got a feel for the media guy. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think he's so pleased that there's social distancing measures right now. Because... Um, <laughs> I think John Yems looks like he might, you know, flip his lid at any point. But an awful performance from Crawley in that first half. Credit to Harrogate going there, getting a 3-1 win. Um, you know, I mean, it's a shame for them that Will Smith, who's just come back from a nasty hamstring injury, is going to be out for three games. Um, is it three or one, actually, for a professional foul? Mm, I don't know. I don't know, I actually. I can't remember. I mean, it was a straight red, so usually yeah. that's three. But that I, I think always think that's violent conduct. And there's, Yeah, I can't get my head around the the suspension rule sometimes but uh, he's going to be out for a minimum of a game maybe three which is a shame because he's a key player for them but Josh Marsh on the score sheet Martin's come into that side and done well I think Paik is a good signing he's looked good as a sort of a, a wide player and Harrogate are starting to show that the, the transfer window business that they did has, has helped them as a squad because they were very thin on numbers and they looked they looked good full of energy yesterday Picks up an important win. Leighton Orient and Colchester nil nil. Steve Ballside still without a win in what is it nine games now. Um, no surprises that this one was rather tentative and, and you know. But Danny Johnson is getting back fit, isn't he? He was on the bench I think yesterday for Leighton Orient, which is massive for them. Stevenage and Morecambe two all. Um, Stevenage played really well actually, and probably will feel that this is a, a result that got away from them because they they had a good enough performance to to win it, but they. You know, they will be frustrated. Um, Adam Phillips leaving to go to yeah. Accrington, that's a huge loss for them. And Will Digg is a nice, you know, who's been there a few years now, but he's, he's a nice player to have. But I, I do feel that's a that's a bigger loss than perhaps Derek Adams is letting on. It's 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 a it's a disappointing one, isn't it? Yeah, very disappointing, um, especially with Morecambe being in the position they are, which I don't think any of us uh, placed them as playoff contenders at the start of the season. Um, so yeah, I think I think they'll really miss miss Phillips. Yeah, I thought it was a bit wrong to do it on deadline day when there's no chance to replace him personally. I, you know, I know they got uh, is it Alex Denny from Salford, but no no comparison yeah. whatsoever there between the two of them. So yeah, I did feel that's a, that's a little bit um, a little bit harsh to do that on deadline day, but it is football. It is what it is, and it's it's always the it's always the risk. Um, 
other big result, Newport got a win, despite, like we say, disciplinary issues. Um, Grimsby were the better team for the first half of this game, looked very different from the sides that we've watched recently. But another red card, is that four, am I right in saying that's four in five games, and aren't they pretty much all for reckless challenges? I think it's three in a row, four in five, and five in seven, I think it <laughs> <Jesus>. is now. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? I mean, it's you know, Mike Flynn dreadful. will be... I mean, he was fuming with Joss Labadee after getting red carded at Oldham. Um, you know, and this is this is their midfield experience. People doing this is Bennett, Labadee, Sheehan. Uh, you've got Shepard getting sent off for a... You know, again, like I said last week, I don't think he actually caught the player, but it's like two-footed, needless lunges. Uh just for, how frustrated must he be? But they got the win, which is the important thing. Nicky Maynard uh, slotting home. And I think this is a galling defeat as they come for, for Grimsby because after that first half display, you thought they're gonna, there's only going to be one team that goes in on wins this. And they, they, they didn't do it. And it just leaves them stuck in the mire. I think it's seven defeats in nine now to Grimsby it, it's so difficult you you can't put any of this on Paul Hurst I think we discussed that in previous weeks it's not on him you just know I just feel like they're so close to getting out of this trouble they're still able to catch Barrow even though Barrow got some games on them I just don't know if I'm, feel they're going to be able to get enough points which is a real shame to say they're in a much better position to do so uh, than they were I think, before the transfer window. I mean, to be fair, I was a bit down on the, the shop coming back, the now John Lewis, but I've been told, like Lewis Cox, from who, who follows Shrewsbury for the uh, for the Star newspaper, he is insistent that he was a key player for Paul Hurst in the time at Shrewsbury. So it'd be interesting to see the impact of those guys. And I assume it must be his character that's so big and so important. Yeah, um, I didn't get this signing either. Well, I, I, apparently Paul Hurst trusts him impeccably. And I, if Paul Hurst is signing players that he knows and trusts to work hard and do the business for him on the pitch, then you can't really you can't really fault him for that. I think he needs that in the position that they're in. And He's someone who's got a very good connection with Christmas Town as well. From yeah. as well. So he's, he's very well loved there. So you're hopeful that maybe he can contribute in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like they are in a much better position. They just need... They just need to bloody start winning some games. Like, you know, it's all very well performing much better, but a 1 0 defeat without scoring yet again um, is, is not helping them at all. And the final team we've got to talk about is Trammy Rovers. A 3 1 win. That's five straight victories, seven unbeaten for Rovers now. Uh, James Vaughan, who I still maintain, I know Mullin has scored more goals than him, but in terms of who would I rather have in my team? Just, I'd have James Vaughan any day of the week. Yeah. yeah. Any day of the week. And that's not being unfair to Paul Mullen, but Paul Mullen's having the season of his life, no doubt about it. But James Vaughan is clinical and has had season after season of scoring loads of goals. He's so athletic. Um, you know, he's such a strong player. 32 is, he's, he's not that old. You know, 32, He's getting to the sort of the latter years of his career, but he's certainly got a lot to give. And they yeah. they added players like James New, uh, sorry um, Dave Nugent, you know, into this into this team in the transfer window. Uh, Danny Lloyd had another storm yesterday. And Ed, did did you not watch this game? I did, yeah. And Trummer were fantastic. I noticed every time I watch Trummer, I notice the same things that they've got this ability to really show their fluidity, particularly in midfield, and the quality they've got when they're on the ball. And then when they're off the ball, they don't give you a second. They're rugged, they're ruthless, they're really physical, they're able to battle with anyone on the pitch, make it really difficult to have any time on the ball or create any really meaningful opportunities. Paul Vale's goal yesterday was basically from a ball that fell quite for chooses to Jake Taylor, and Scott Davis, the keeper, really should have done a lot better with it, to be honest, with the shot. So that was the only thing of real note that Port Vale created. Every time I watch Tram as well, Jay Spearing stands out by a mile. Yeah. He's fantastic in that deep role, the way that he can play these clever little touches and passes when he's under pressure. And then when he gets time on the ball, he can pick people out from range. A lovely pass through to Kane Willery for the first goal. And Danny Lloyd has got to be in the running for signing of the season. He's been absolutely fantastic. He's played in midfield. He's played out on the wing. He's played up the top. He's played he's number so 10 as well, fluid. isn't he? He's played number 10. He's so fluid on the ball. He's someone who wants to get the ball down, capable of beating a man, puts a great ball into him out wide. And he's such a relentless pressure presser off the ball as well. He's been easily one of the signings of the season. And I think they picked him up in November, so he was a three agents for ages. And 
it's been Tranmere's huge game to get him in. We're finally like seeing what, what what he did at Stockport, which he hadn't quite replicated in the EFL yet, and we're starting to see that now, I think. Well, I thought he was excellent at Peterborough in that season. You know, I really did. And that was in League One, and I thought he yeah. was superb for them at Peterborough. The Salford move, you know, was what it is, and the, I think Salford have proved they they not a kind of place where, unless you hit the ground running, they don't give you a chance, and I... Yeah, I thought he wasn't particularly well treated by Salford. I might. I thought. I, might be I, wrong. Thought, you should, I thought you should have got a bit longer at Peterborough, actually. Yeah, I think the manager change was what triggered his move because Steve Evans came in, didn't he? Because he was he was playing under Grant McCann. Steve Evans yes. came in and, and was just said to him, you know, you're not in my plans, and and that's that. So, um, bit of a shame for him. But I mean, you know, he kept himself super fit. Despite not having a club over the summer, he was running miles and miles. I, was, I, I had a chat with him, uh, uh, just saying like, "How are you doing? How are you keeping it fit?" And you know, he was running kilometres, and, and he was doing it in ridiculous times. You, know, you can see how he's kept himself in shape, and what a wonderful addition he's been. Um, and like you say, I wouldn't be surprised. Like you say, if, if, if someone mentioned him for a signing of the season award, if they if they even uh, existed. There was such but, a thing, but he's he's so important to that Trumbe team. Mm. Much like Kane Woolley on the side, fantastic pair of wingers with James Vaughan showcasing his mobility as a lone striker. And I love that they're playing Otis Khan at right back as well, because I think that was the big problem I had with Tranmere, that they had dynamic left sided players in Liam Rydell and Callum McDonald, but they never quite had the same on the right hand side. I remember there was a point they were playing with McDonald and Rydell out there, which two left backs at full back you were never really keen on. And Leo Connor, who can play right back, but for me is a bit more defensive minded, someone you'd rather play a bit more to shut teams out rather than push forward. So they've gone without his card there, and he's absolutely flourishing. I, yeah, I think that was one of those accidental things, isn't it, where you have a, a crisis, you play a player, then go, oh, that worked. Well, yeah, keep... that worked really well. He's got to compete in the midfield as well. There's so much midfield quality. So getting him into the team as a right back, it's really showing because he's such a great dynamic player. I uh, love it, love it. And uh, Keith Hill, who for all the criticism he got when he arrived, he's he's doing a great job. <laughs> yeah. It's still the funniest manager announcement ever. It was great, it was great. <laughs> um, he's been fantastic. He's yes. done a great job. And I think if, if I'm Tramir now, I'd quickly tie up Danny Lloyd for another year, for sure. Uh, before Because he's going to have some suitors as well. I think that they've got to make sure that they're ahead of the game on that one. But if you look at the league table, you've got Cambridge top, Forest Green second, Tramir in third now, and that's no surprise at all with those wins that they've had five in a row, like I said. Newport back up to fourth, but do we trust their form or their players' discipline? We'll have to wait and see on that one. Exeter and Carlisle, who Carlisle just don't play football at the moment today, not consistently anyway. This, all their games cancelled either by COVID or by the weather. So uh, Morecambe in seventh, Cheltenham, like I say, and Salford just outside. So that is an interesting pair of teams to keep an eye on because they're They've certainly got ambitions of, of finishing um, in automatics, even, I'd say, um, let alone the playoffs. So we'll keep an eye on those two. Southend, who didn't play yesterday, their bottom. Grimsby, uh, two points adrift of Barra, who need to get their acting gear quickly to pull away because they are the one team that you feel could be caught right now. Bolton, interesting to see how they do when they come back because like, they haven't had a match for a couple of matches um, due to weather, mostly. Yeah. Uh, yeah they've got. 20 years, how? Well, it's indeed, but like I can see them moving up quite quickly, to be fair. Because if you look at how tight the table is, uh, two wins would put Bolton on 37 points, which would stick them in top half the table and then on the cusp of the playoffs. So it's so tight. Don't, don't say that, because you'll, you'll be giving Ed more, more credence to his Bradford comment. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. I don't see it. To be fair, I, if either of them make the playoffs, I, I'll tip my hat to them because that would be a great achievement considering where they are. Um, but like I said, time will tell. Thank you to all of you who've listened to this, uh, especially to our patrons. If you want to be a patron and help support this podcast and the website, please do. It's as cheap as $1 a month to help support what we're doing, giving hopefully enjoyable low league content in a light-hearted manner. Uh, Chris, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Uh, Think, are you still watching the cricket? Is it still on? Yeah, it's on, on, on for another couple of hours and then uh, off to my support bubbles house later. Yeah, have a, have a good one, mate. Ed, what's your plans for the rest of the day? Um, I'm not too sure, to be honest. I'm not really a big cricket fan. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. It's free to watch. Get it on. It's great. <laughs> oh, sure it is. Well, whatever you guys are doing, enjoy it. And whatever you are doing, listener, enjoy it as well. I hope you have a good week and we'll be back in yeah next Sunday so until then goodbye